This is the Happy House Hunters Group, and we go through the six F's of real estate every six months. Uh, so the first one is how to find the deal. Then you have to learn how to fund the. Well, first of all, you have to find the deal. So talk to Kyle. I don't know where he is on your screen, but he's right here on my screen. Uh, so you have to find the deal and then you have to fund the deal. And then we've, we've got Adam. I have to point the right way on my screen. There's Adam. He funds the deal for you. And then you have to fix the deal depending on how much needs fixing. And so John is, is going to be chatting with us today about fixing and, uh, and, and the process that he goes through. Um, and then, of course, once you find it and fund it and fix it, then you have to decide, are you going to flip it or are you going to fill it? Is it going to be one that um, you're, you're going to turn it over and make a profit on it and then do it again? We all heard about the Burr method, uh, which is very easy and successful for a lot of folks getting started in real estate investing. And then, of course, to fill it would be to buy and hold it. And I'm a buy and hold investor. So um, I, I flipped a few, but I never go in and into them with the intent to flip. Um, I, I purchase real estate. And then every so many months, I look at my portfolio and uh, and I might trim off the one that's not um, actually bringing in the cash flow that I want it to bring in. So I call that a long flip. <laughs> it's one where I may have uh, had it and was holding it for even a year or two or more and then deciding to move it on. And, and flip it out of the portfolio. And so then, of course, the buy and hold. And then after that, how many of those do you have to do to have a free style lifestyle? Now, I do want to say, and we always, we always have somebody come in and talk to us about freedom and that freedom number. And I do want to say, be careful what you wish for, because sometimes uh, if you just wish for freedom for the sake of freedom, then you don't know what to do with yourself once you have that freedom. So, um, that's why we always have some folks come in with uh, what the freedom number means to them and what they're doing with it. Uh, to me, it meant that I could travel more um, because I'm in the other end of the investing spectrum. I'm at the retirement age. And so I wanted to travel more and do all that fun stuff that, you know, you always told yourself you're going to do all those years you were, you know, punching the time clock like someday. I'm going to go to Italy. Well, guess what? Mark and I got to go to Italy last November. And this year we're off to London and Paris. And uh, and so it's just kind of fun to be able to have the freedom to do that. And I can run my businesses from anywhere in the world. Now, we're talking about fixing today. So even after you find it and you fund it and you fix it the first time, and then let's decide that you're going to hold it, you're going to it's going to be one that you're going to fill. Now you have to keep fixing because things happen. There's those maintenance issues that create a fixing um, budget all the time. Um, today, I have 28 doors and I am in the middle of, uh, on my fourplex, I am literally, literally today, I am in the middle of working with the water department and, uh, and our maintenance uh, company and they are actually swapping out meters so we can split the meters on a fourplex. We've never done that before. It's kind of expensive to do. It's a big deal. The water has to be off and, you know, at the street and then everything has to work before we can get the water, before we can get it all inspected and the water back on. And so it's a big deal. And so that's, that's where I'm at today is that I'm in the middle of working with the water department, getting, getting these meters split out. And I've got a property that needs a new roof. And then I've got another property that needs um, all the brick tuck pointed. And so there's always fixing to be done. It's a part of the process. And so sometimes I think a brand new investor that wants to buy and hold, I think that sometimes maybe they think that as soon as they buy it and get it rented for the first time, that they're done. And they're like, okay, whoop, done. Passive income from here on out. Yeah, well, until the first windstorm comes through and blows all the gutters off the house <laughs> and all the downspouts. So you get it. So that's kind of where we're at today is, is not just fixing it on the initial flip, getting it ready to rent, but we're talking about uh, long-term, what has to go into all of that fixing. So we've got some other folks coming on board here. We're going to um, allow a couple other folks here to chat with us. Uh, so welcome. We've got Tom and Elise just jumped on. So welcome. Glad you're here. 
And uh, John, we're going to start off. Share with me your journey. And I know we've we've interviewed you before. It was an amazing interview. And as a matter of fact, um, it was it was so fun when I first met Adam's dad. He said to me, "That interview you did with that John guy was so good." <laughs> That was, that was the interview that he listened to, and he really appreciated it. So tell us again, for the folks that are listening that may have not heard that first interview, um, what is your journey? How did you actually get into real estate at all? And then I just shared with you uh, when we came on today that I've been watching you grow into the role that you're in today. So tell us a little bit of your backstory, John. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the. Uh... The, I mean, we really enjoyed that interview as well. Uh, my wife, Sarah, was on it with me and she works it with me as well. I'll get into that more, but we enjoyed it as well. So thank you for saying that. Um, and thank you, Adam's dad, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I started out in real estate. So I, um, I owned a home and we had lived there for about five years. And I decided when we were ready for our next home that instead of selling that home, I uh, decided, hey, I want to, uh, you know, keep it and rent it out, you know, retain it as a rental. Um, we bought that home in 2013. So we had seen, you know, good appreciation sen since then. And this was about 2018. And so I started doing research and, you know, I'm reading on bigger pockets and I'm listening to podcasts and I'm trying to glean as much information as I can. And it just got me really excited about real estate. Um and I, I, you know, the more I researched, the more I realized, hey, you know, actually, I want to get into real estate investing. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I had been kind of looking to change careers as it was. And so I thought, hey, this is something I'm really excited about. Uh, I really see the value in this and the opportunity in this. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to get my real estate license. Um, and when I got my license, I actually, uh, like I said, I was looking for a career change. I'd been managing uh, kitchens, restaurants for 10 years, and I got a job as a property manager. Okay, now so am I, I was, do I remember correctly that you and Sarah actually met at the restaurant when you were We did at the meet restaurant? at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Sarah so, has, so you guys worked together. We did work together. And uh, yeah, so we met at the restaurant. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so, and she, she has a bunch of different degrees, but now she doesn't do any, use any of them and she works with me. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so I, um, I got a job in property management and I was managing long-term rentals, scattered site all around Columbus, mostly single family, small multifamily properties. And it was about 500 doors by the time I was like, you wow. know what? I really like working with investors. I like investing in real estate, but the property management, eh, I'm ready to get into working with doing sales effectively. I had my license. I had been doing some sales, but really when you're doing that much property management, you don't have time to commit to doing, you know, full book of business for sales. So I transitioned out of uh, the um, management into sales, uh, working with investors. Um, and, you know, I still work with investors today. Um, most of my, a lot of my clients are out of state um, and they choose to invest in Columbus. Um, so I did that for a while and um, you know, I'm always trying to be forward thinking. And so I kind of was like assessing the market and I said, Hey, you know, we're appreciating so much, uh, prices are going up, rents are going up, but they're not following the same trend line. Um, you know, this is back when we had like 3% interest mm -hmm. rates. So it wasn't really an issue with cash flow, but I was like, you know, if something changes here, or if this continues, uh, you know, cash flow might get a little bit more difficult to find. You know, you can't just pick it off the tree. So I was like, how can I still provide this, um, oppor these opportunities to investor clients? And the way that I, the the route that I decided to take, and as we all know, there's a million different ways to make money in real estate. But the route that I took was, hey, I want to get into short-term and mid-term rentals. And so I decided that, hey, I need to own some first, right? So uh, at the same time, we were building our house and we were designing it. It's a custom built house. So we decided that uh, the lower level of our house, because it's a walkout basement, is going to be a short term rental. And now, so that 
that's where I came in. I, yes. I was looking for guests on, um, and, and to answer, um, Sue's question, she said, where can we find that earlier interview? And I answered that they're all recorded and saved in the Academy. That first one I think was on our short-term rental podcast. Yes, it was. And, yeah. And so if you go over to the Academy for those that, that, uh, but, and again, all the replays are free. So if you go to the Kathy Benner International Academy and and scroll over to the real estate link, um, look for it, the uh, podcast title was called The Ins and Outs of Opening uh, a, a, a Guest House, a Bed and Breakfast. It, you'll see it. It's, it's how to open a, a short-term rental. Anyway, if you scroll down, you'll find the interview that uh, John and I did back then. Well, and Sarah was on then too. But that's where I came into the picture. So I took a chance. And I think it was maybe, I don't know, midweek in, in, in an afternoon, I showed up at his house as he was building out this short-term rental in his lower level. Do you remember that, John? And you I do remember food, that, yeah. And you said, here's what this is going to be, and here's what that's going to be. And you weren't even finished yet. And then we went full circle. And when he opened and had his grand opening, he invited us back. I took Mark with me the second time and we ended up going to his opening um, and seeing the finished product and, and it's beautiful. So um, tell us what were some of the challenges that you faced when you were putting that together? Because you had to do a lot of work to get to get the, the units. And then you even had like a third unit, like a mother-in-law suite in addition yeah. to the short-term space. So tell us about that. Yeah, so it's funny. Um, you know, when we design the house, like you mentioned, it's really effectively three units. We have our living space, we have a mother-in-law suite, and then we have the lower level, which is a short-term rental. Um, so in my infinite wisdom, when we were building the house, I decided, hey, I'm not going to have the builder do the finish out the lower level, right? I'm going to do it myself. I'll hire contractors and do it, you know, because, hey, obviously, you know, I mean, I've done plenty of flips and rehabs and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, Looking back on it, I probably just should have had him do it, but I that's not what I did. Um, and the reason being is uh, the contractor that I hired at the time uh, didn't really work out. Um, I had used them before on previous jobs, but you know when I was there on the project day in, day out, I just wasn't satisfied with the work they were doing. Okay, uh, tell us why. What? Because we've got all investors in this call. Sure. What, what was it that you weren't satisfied with? Um, just some examples. Yeah, I mean, I think that their their philosophy, I think, was, hey, we're going to make every guy a jack of all trades, right? So we can send this this crew to do it all at a project. But I don't think that's an effective method of rehab. Um, I think you need to have your painters. You need to have your drywallers. You need to have your framers, you know, uh, your finished guys. And and I think because they had that that method or, or whatever you want to call it, it, it slowed things down tremendously because, you know, when you do something day in, day out, you're going to have efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think there was a lot of efficiencies occurring. And, you know, when you live there, you can watch it day in, day out, right? Because you and were so, living upstairs as they were working on this. Right, okay. right. We had moved in. The upstairs was complete. Uh, but, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for us was... Well, there was many, but the final one was they were going to install granite, the granite countertops in the kitchen downstairs. And instead of hiring a granite company, which is what 99% of all contractors do, because it's a very nuanced technical thing, mm -hmm. they decided that they were going to buy unfinished granite and do it themselves in the unit. So they're cutting out the sink. It looks like trash. I'm like, what am I paying for with this? You, you, there's no way you're going to fix this. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with granite, but you you cannot breathe that in. The the dust that they create, it's, it's not healthy to breathe in. And you're it's, living there. We're living there. So with, our the baby, HAC, with the baby. With the baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they they did cut it outside, but then they brought it inside to like grind it and smooth it out. And there was no way they were going to be able to do it anyways. So I was like, you know what, this is it. Get out. We're done. Like this, it, it was one thing after another, but that was the final thing. So one of the, the, the lessons that I would take from that, because the writing was on the wall way before that, cut your losses, fire fast. 
If you can tell, hey, this is not going to work, end it. Because all that is, is it's cost. It's mm -hmm. cutting into your time. Time is money in this business. And we, so we are very close to, uh, we're walking distance from the Memorial mm -hmm. uh, Golf golf uh, Tournament. So, so for, those, for those of you that are not in the Columbus area, this is the Muirfield big golf tournament every year brings in thousands of people and millions of dollars into the community right. and john's short-term rental is within walking distance right so it's one week out of the year it's our best week of the year every year but we missed it that year the very first year because these people took way longer than than they said they would and, we, and then we expected so fire fast is what i took away from that um uh, you know, I can get into like some of the <laughs> trials and tribulations that we had after it started. Um, if you want me to to go into that. Um, well, yeah, that was that was another one of my questions is, um, you know, once you got open, did you and, and again, I want to say this to everybody that's listening. I don't care if you're rehabbing a house for the first time and you're going to buy and hold it long term, midterm, short term. Sometimes you can't tell what needs fixed until folks start using it and living in it. So, John, what kind of things popped up after you opened? So the big issue that we had was we had plumbing issues. So this is a brand new house, right? Not high expectations that things are going to, there's going to be major plumbing issues, sewage issues. Um, so we were happy once people started really living in the unit and using it, um, we were having plumbing sewage backup. So obviously not ideal. Uh, so and, it and so now for those of you that want to get into the short term race, your reviews are everything. That's And I don't know about you, but when I start to travel, I do look at the reviews. And oftentimes on these online sites where you can book these different places, you can actually even filter that you only want the four and five star review places to pop up. So if your unit isn't getting those reviews, you're not even going to come up for a lot of folks that are searching, uh, looking for a place to stay. So your reviews are very important when you're in the short, midterm and short term uh, lane. And so here, here's John, brand new, brand new everything. And now he's got plumbing issues and, and sewer backup issues. Right. So wow. It was very stressful and it was ongoing because we'd have the plumber come out, snake it. We're like, OK, it's going to be OK now. Continued. And then it would back up again. And now, luckily, we were right there. So we're able to take care of it immediately. Um, but of course, very stressful. And you're right. First one, first guest, second guest. And it's like that sets the tone for mm -hmm. the reviews to come. Right now, luckily, we were able to secure five-star reviews because, you know, obviously mm -hmm. we were right there. Like hospitality is number one. Um, and eventually we did find the problem by uh, running a camera. There was a check valve uh, that was broken. So we were able to get into the wall. We had to cut out the wall. And now there's an access panel there. Uh, to but get into but the now you had to do that in between guest bookings. Right. Well, we ended up doing it when the guests were there because it was so important that, okay. you know, hey, this is what it's going to take. And, you know, they understood. Um, luckily, we had great guests at the front end because it easily could have been, you know, a deal breaker for people. I mean, without question and understandably so. But uh, we haven't had that issue since. So uh, it was it was a trial, but we can look back on it and laugh now. We were not laughing at the time. Oh, I bet. I yeah. bet, especially since you had just come through all the delays. You missed the first year of, of the Muirfield tournament. Right. You're now finally open. You've got guests starting to come, and now you've got this issue, and you don't even know what it is. Exactly. It was <laughs> it was terrible, but, you know, we made it through. Well, and so, again, the, the moral of that story is, is you have to always look at the bigger picture. You know, you can't get down in the weeds and get stuck there. You have to always look at the bigger picture. And just know, and, and here's where I think a lot of us fall short, we don't have the reserves in our back pocket to handle some of these surprises. And so put back some reserves and be prepared for that. So when it happens, it, it doesn't blow your budget totally out of the water. You, you've got to have some reserves for those unexpected fixes that pop up. Now, you're a realtor now, and so now you're out, you're, you're selling, 
you're also doing short-term management. Give us an idea when you work with a client and let's start with just uh, somebody that's going to maybe just buy and hold a property. Um, how, and again, Adam's our funding guy, Kyle is our find it guy, but how do you, once, once you're working with the client, how do you convince them what they need to fix so that they can go forward with the property? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of nuance to that. It depends on what their goals are for the property. So, you know, and it will be different depending on those goals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we're looking, if we're working with a client who's going to be, maybe their property is going to be a short-term rental, uh, your finishes are going to need to be nicer than if it were, you know, just a long-term, uh, mm -hmm. you know, conventional rental. Um, so, you know, we, we do, we do always, you know, work with them on what, what expectations should be like, Hey, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to come in and do a full cosmetic rehab or, you know what, some paint and maybe, you know, new carpet that might be enough in a, for a long-term rental. It, it depends on the property and it depends on the strategy. Um, you know, one, there, there are, there is a thing that you can see just by looking at the property, but then there's also the stuff that you don't see unless you have a very trained eye. Um, I, I like to think that I have a fairly trained eye, but I'm also not a contractor. I'm not an inspector. Mm -hmm. I've been in a lot of properties and I've, you know, I've rehabbed a lot of properties. Um, the one, one of the things that I think is, it's, it's very important to the functionality of a, of a property is the mechanicals. Yes. Um, and mechanicals can be very expensive. Uh, it's not sexy, uh, but you know, your furnace, your hot water tank, your electrical, your plumbing, uh, even things like, uh, you know, you get to the roof, the exterior, you mentioned tuck pointing. I mean, again, these are not exciting things, but, uh, you want your property in top shape because if it's not, things tend to domino and, it, you can find yourself in a pit. Um, you know, so I, my opinion is always, you want to fix everything on the front end before so you start do, operating you, that property. But how ahead. do you know what to fix? I mean, here you are, I, I'm, I'm your buyer. I'm, I, I found a property I like, or you found one for me and I, I I'm putting it in contract. You kind of know where I want to go with it. And then I turn to you and I say, John, what what do you think all I'm what what all do you think I'm going to have to fix before I can actually rent it, whether it's long term, short term, mid term, whatever? Um, how how do I determine what needs to be fixed? And I again, always I, I always I wanna, advise. I want to say some of that stuff does show up when somebody moves in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I always advise my clients to get out property inspection. So that's probably uh, outside of like you know I, I'll always walk a property for a client before we move forward, assuming I can, it's not curb offers only. Um, regardless, uh, after that walkthrough, I'm gonna say, hey, just so you know, this stuff's probably gonna show up on the report. Like the roof looks old, hot water tanks old, you know, galvanized pipes, whatever it may be, knob and tube wiring. There, There's a myriad of possibilities that I can see. I mean, maybe you'll even see a little termite damage or something, you never know. I'm gonna point all that out to my clients that I okay. see. But there is always going to be stuff that I don't see, um, because again, I'm not, I'm not an inspector. I'm not there for four hours on a property right. inspection. I'm walking the property for 20, 30 minutes, um, and I, you know, I do look for this stuff. But mm -hmm. the the inspection report is going to tell you a lot about what you need to know beyond, hey, the cosmetics are X, uh, you know, the hot water tank is from 2007, whatever. Um, so that's going to be a good starting point. We're going to, I'm, I always review every report with my clients um, so that we can make a list of items that we think are going to need to be done. Um, additionally, you know, contractors, walking the property with contractors, they're going to have an eye for things that, uh, you know, I may miss as well. Um, and so just having a team like that is very helpful in putting together what will need to be done to get the, the property up and running and functional. I agree. And just for everyone that's listening on this call, we're your team, guys. We're your team. You've, you've got the finders, the funders, the fixers. You've got us all right here. And and my, my sweet spot is filling and being a landlord. And I've got all the systems in place for that. So we're your team. So, uh, you know, lean on us if you have questions uh, about all of this. 
But I do know that uh, what John's talking about, it's very important. And one of the things is depending on the funding that you're going to get for that property, sometimes depend that that also reflects on what has to be fixed. So if you're buying a house, and let's say you're going to house hack and you're going to live, like say, let's say you buy a double and you're going to live in one half and rent the other half and you're going to get it on FHA. Well, an FHA has a lot higher standards on what has to be fixed um, before or right after, depending how that's how, how your paperwork is written up there um, on, on how you're going to get an FHA funding. And so there is a lot of differences there uh, as far as, as what has to be fixed. If you're buying something cash, uh, and no inspections, and you, you've you been down in the trenches enough that you definitely say everything on this house is going to need fixed. That's usually Mark and I buy that kind. Um, we, you know, we just know it's going to need a furnace, it's going to need hot water, it's going to need wiring, it's going to need plumbing, it might need a roof, it might need some foundation uh, repair. We, we already know that uh, before we even make a cash offer on some of these properties. But then you better have your team in your back pocket depending on how quickly you need to start generating cash flow from this property. So all of that comes into play and, and every deal is different. Am I right, guys? Those of you that are that do this, every deal is different. All and different. so you have to look at each deal on its own merits. So I get that. So um, give us some specifics on, on some folks that you've worked with or maybe on the short-term rentals that you're now managing because John also has his own management company now. Remember, he said he worked for a management company, but now he has his own. So tell us a little bit about that and how do you handle those repairs through your management company? Sure. Um, so to that, uh, yeah, so I, I am a real estate broker. I own my own brokerage. And as part of the brokerage, we have a management company. Now we are specialized in that we uh, we manage short term and mid term rentals only, strictly furnished rentals. Um, most of our properties are mid term. We do have short terms as well, but it's probably about eighty percent mid terms. Okay. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the mid term is thirty days plus, but it's still furnished, whereas a short term is less than thirty days. That's the distinction. Um, so. You know, we we will get properties in various, a lot of times I will help people buy the property. So we know what we're getting into on the front end, but that's not always the case. We we work with other agents who refer their clients to us as well. So there, you know, it may be, we may not know what we're getting into until we basically take on management. I mean, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to walk the property and we're going to say, okay, we're going to need to do this, 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 and this. Um, and, you know... Uh, we, and, and so we, as in, you know, as a management company, we have vendors that we work with day in, day out that are our team, you know, cause again, we can't do everything. So if, if we need a roof, if it needs new HVAC, if it needs, you know, a new kitchen, we have vendors that we work with consistently to be able to do that. Um, and so that's and we will work closely with them on coming up with a plan, getting quotes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, what I will say about the management company is, uh, you know, we will oversee uh, like a unit turn, getting a property up and running, but we are not project managers. Um, not that I can't do it. I do it for myself, but uh, I don't take on that liability effectively. So if you're talking, hey, this property needs a full rehab. Um, we're going to ask that you work directly with the contractors on that uh, because that's not the role that we take on. Um, we say, you know, uh, of course, if you need some opinions on things like that, obviously we want everything to be A1 for everyone involved. So we're happy to help, but we're not going to day in, day out manage the project um, because that's, again, not the role we've decided to take on. So yeah, I um, go ahead. No, I say I, I get that because yeah. again, your your liability. All of a sudden, you're down in the weeds managing this one. That becomes a full time job, <laughs> right? <laughs> if it's a exactly, and there, you know, there's a lot to it. So, um, you know, what I will say is that we refer people we trust that we've worked with for years. Um, so there is some some sense of you know stability in that. Um, we know that the people that we're referring are going to do a good job, and and it's important to us because. 
you know, we're going to be managing this property, right? We don't well, want a mess. It's your, it's your reputation too, as exactly. a management company. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. our name is on the company. So, um, you know, and as you mentioned previously, this is a review-based business. So, uh, you know, we have high standards because the guest has high high standards. So um, it's it's very important that we, you know, that we make sure on the back end, everything is A1, 100%. So that when we go to place the first guest, it's going to be okay, right? It's going to be, they're going to enjoy their experience because if you don't find the problem, the guest will find the problem. And <laughs> and so, this is so true. it's our job to find the problem. Um, it, to the point of the previous story, until the stuff gets used as well, it's tough to know of every little thing. So yeah, I mean, usually there are there is an issue or two after rehab. You can do your best. You can think it's all done, and there there will you will find something that hey, we have to come in and make make sure that's is taken care of. But um, so we have we have a couple of questions. Um, sure. and and the first the first question is from Carmela. She said, "How do you start and find look and find a good management company if you have a property in another location?" And we're talking about in a, in another state even. Sure. Um, how how would you interview those property management companies to find a good one? Um, well, I mean, you're going to want to ask a lot of questions. Um, it depends on the strategy. I mean, I can probably speak best to to short midterm rentals, mm -hmm. um, but I I would well, start. I, I know, what I would I start know with. Carmela and I know Carmela and and the property she has, she's wanting to do a mid or short term. So okay. yeah. Um, one thing that I think is important is, as I mentioned previously, we manage all of our properties through the brokerage. It is a, you know, we're licensed with the state of Ohio. We have to follow a myriad of laws and regulations um, as we manage these properties. So we are very invested in this business. There, there, there are, that's one way to do it. Uh, and we are a full service management company. So we handle every aspect of the property. I tell our clients, you can be as involved or as uh, hands off as you want to be. But the only thing I really need from you is to make sure you're paying the mortgage. Um, beyond that, we can handle everything for you. Um, there is there's a juxtaposition uh, of another option that people choose, they prefer to use, which is a co-host. And uh, co-hosts as a myriad of, you know, it's a range of what they do. A lot of them will just do the guest communication and organizing of making sure the cleaner gets in there, that kind of thing. You know, it it they may be very hands-on, they may not be, but anyone can be a co-host. Uh, there's no legal requirements that you have to do X, Y, or Z. Um, at least I can speak to the state of Ohio. You do not need a real estate license to manage uh, short-term rentals. So, you know, you can take that as you will. Um, some people are great with that. Other people, it's like, Hey, um, you know, we're, we're going to do every little piece for you. And we're going to, we're going to manage your money as well with a trust account. So what that does is it takes, it takes a lot of the work out of the investor's hands. Um, because then so, they're taking care of any, anything that needs fixed. They're going to just take care of it since right. they're managing the money as well. Right. So we are able to put the utilities in our name so that say the power goes out at your property on 123 Main Street, uh, you know, at, at 1130 at night. If the power is in your name as the owner, I, my hands are tied as the as the manager. Right. I have to call you. Maybe you're asleep and, you know, we're not able to get this figured out until 10 o'clock the next morning. Well, maybe the guest has a baby and they need to heat up the formula. I mean, anything. So it, it it's things like that, that gives us the power to take better care of the property. That again, this is all review based. So it, it takes the owner out of this, the situation. And uh, I feel like I'm getting away from how do you find a good property management company though? But anyways, so consider those two things. Are you looking for a co-host? Are you looking for more of a full-time property management company? I would say you're going to want to ask a lot of questions. Go online, Google, what questions do I ask a property management company? Because I could not sit here. I mean, it could take the whole podcast to list all the questions that you should be asking a property management company. Um, a big feel of it is, um, hey, how many properties do you manage, right? Because that's going to affect 
their ability to manage your property? Are you just going to be a number? Are you one of a million? Or are you one of 50 that say, hey, um, you know, we we know you by name. We we are going to communicate with you as, you know, Jane Doe versus or Carmela Banks versus, you know, oh, the owner of this property. I don't remember their name. I, you know, whatever. Um, so that that's an important piece of it. How do you how do you vibe with the people that you're that that are managing the, the property? Um, can you get referrals? Will they will they refer out some other owners for you to to kind of uh, give references? Um, I, that, that's how I would start. Um, but I would say the biggest thing is Google, Google what to ask a property management company and, uh, and start with those questions. Well, I, I agree with all of that. And I know sometimes it's kind of hard to find those management companies. And I will tell you, uh, for all of us that are listening on this call, um, don't, don't, don't think it's one and done. Sometimes yeah. you you have to, you know, you have to give the management company a little bit of a test drive and see if you do work well with them and what's important to you. And everybody has, and, and I'm sure John can attest to this, everybody has a different idea of what is important. And, and everybody has a different idea of what is an emergency in uh, all of these situations. And so you have to kind of, you know, work with a management company for a minute and see if it's going to be a good fit to be part of your team. And, uh, and if it's not, then don't, don't, um, you know, don't hesitate to maybe try another management company. And so you have to be careful with that, with the contracts that you're signing. So John, talk to us about that. If folks go on board with you, do they have a way um, that, do they have an out clause if they decide it's not working for them? I mean, yeah. how do you handle that? Yeah, so I mean, our contracts are for a year because every contract has to have a timeline, uh, time frame. Um, but what I mean, we have it built in that any any party can give a thirty day notice. Okay. If you're not happy with our services, we don't want to hold anyone that doesn't want to work with us, right? Right. Um, we've never had if there's ever been an issue of someone taking a property from us uh, because I think that we do a great job, and I think that 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 speaks to that. Um, but again, it's a thirty day out, right? Uh, we do a great job for our clients. So that's easy for us to say, right? Now we need to have some time to offload a property because we're going to have guests in there. We're going to, you know, it, it, so we do, we would need 30 days, but um, you know, that's important. And it's an important question to ask a property management company. Uh, you know, if I'm not happy with the situation, am I allowed out? Uh, you don't want your property to be held hostage. I always tell clients like, Hey, this is your property. We're just managing it for you. You own it. You are the decider. You know, you get to decide everything. And we we are obligated legally to do what you want to do, what you say. Um, now, if what you're saying to us doesn't work for us, because, I mean, we have a portfolio of properties, all of our properties are tied, tied to that portfolio and to our name, then, you know, if your decisions are affecting our business, then we can't work with you. Again, that's not really an issue either. But, you know, it... it it's it's a two-way street. We're working together. You're the property owner. You get to make the final say. Um, we're here to help you to make sure that your property stays uh, up, up and running, cash flowing, and in good condition. Is there different packages that folks can choose with a property management company? Can they say, well, I just want them to uh, put the new tenants in and collect the rent, but I want to do all the maintenance. Or I want them to do everything. I want them to advertise it, get the new tenants, collect the rent, take care of the maintenance. But anything over a thousand dollars, I need to know about, you know, because I don't want a, a, you know, a big expense to hit my budget when I wasn't prepared. Is yeah. there different packages with property management companies that folks can go with? Yeah, I mean, it it depends on the management company. Um, to to some of your points, uh, I mean, I know as an agent. I've found tenants for owners who then decide they want to continue to manage. Um, you know, different property management companies will all do things differently. Um, for us, it's important that, again, since all of, we, we manage all of our properties under one account. So say if, I mean, and we manage on a lot of different platforms, but let's just use Airbnb. Okay. If you're, if you're t looking at a property on Airbnb that we manage under our account, we need to have full control over that because again, 
it's all review based and all of our reviews are tied to our account, which ties to all of our other properties. We have a duty to all of our owners to be giving the same top tier service. Um, now, different property or different managers might do things differently. Uh, and, and so that would be a question to ask. Um, re re regarding your, your, your kind of example of, hey, if it's over $1,000, most management companies will have uh, a price point where they say, we will not make this decision for you without your input at X price. For us, it's $500. Okay. Um, and so if anything is going to cost over $500, we we our contract states that we cannot make that decision for the owner, and and that's important on both ways because hey if it's like oh we need to fix there's a leak under the sink it's going to be 120 bucks but well, we just need to take care of that right it's a guest experience thing there's no oh let me call the owner make sure they're okay with us fixing this leak right no you have to fix the leak it's a it's a safety and health thing for the property and then additionally you can't have a leak so we're just going to go handle that for them. We don't want to call them up on a Sunday, right? Right. Um, now, if it's if it's oh, you know what, the the water line burst, right? It's going to be five thousand dollars because they got to dig it up and blah blah blah. Yeah, we're not going to make that decision for an owner either. Um, so it, you know that's that's kind of the reason for setting that limit. Um, you know, so so to that point, I I think that most management companies do have that hard set where beyond this price point, yeah. You're, they're going to get your approval. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm loving all of this. I want to open it up. If anybody has any questions, uh, please jump in. Uh, all of you, I think I have gone through and allowed all of you to talk. So you do not have to ask the questions in the chat unless you want to. And I've got my eye on the chat. But if you have any questions, just jump in. <clears throat> I have a, just not a question, but a comment just about repairs and, and stuff. Because I just recently had this experience yesterday with a rental property so oh. <laughs> i um house hacked a duplex for about 10 years and then moved out in november and we got it rehabbed and we got it rented yay uh and they moved in uh a saturday and um it was their first night it my lawyer told me hey if you give any appliances if there's any appliances that you provide don't put them in the lease because then, um, you know, if they break, then you don't have to replace them. I'm like, okay, cool. So I told them that and I didn't put appliances in the lease. Um, and I said, hey, look, you know, if anything breaks, you can use the fridge. You can use the stove. You can use the washer and dryer. But if it breaks, it's on you. Sorry. Well, guess what happened? The washer didn't stop working immediately. Like their very first load of laundry they tried to do didn't work. So I'm like, oh, man. So I really had a, a moment where I had to like think about this. It's like, okay, in the lease, it's technically it's on them, but they're also paying a heck of a premium on this rent. And I really and like they probably, them. And they probably just paid their deposit and rent to get moved they in. Just pay, yeah. I mean, they had just given me like $1,800 and then in two weeks, they got to pay me another 1500. So it's like, oh man, that's a lot of money for, and they're young people. I mean, they're in their late twenties maybe. And pretty new in their careers. And I'm like, ah, you know, so I ended up biting the bullet and I went and I found a, 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 a washing machine from Menards and me and the guy, the guy, luckily the tenant had a truck. I don't even have a truck. The tenant had a truck. So we were able to go on a Sunday, pick it up from Menards. Um, I bought uh, those like furniture strap things. Have you ever <laughs> seen those? Yep. They're awesome. I always forget about them until I buy a piece of like equipment or like a like a, an appliance. And then the dudes that move it in have these straps. And I'm like, oh, this is like so easy because you use your whole body instead okay. of like you're just lugging it and like yep. trying to get hand positions and all this stuff. So I bought one of those and we we popped it right in and it was great. And they were happy. I was happy because I mean, at the end of the day, like, I don't know what they're going to put in there. I mean, maybe they just buy something on Facebook and then it has a problem. And and especially like if it's leaking or something or or whatever, then it could cause problems. And I'm like, whatever. It's like 400 bucks. Let me yeah. just do this. And so I don't know. That's kind of a, uh, I think in that instance, it was like, what you know, what's like the right thing to do? Like, yeah, legally, I didn't have to do it. Right. But what's going to make the best relationship for me and the tenants? Right, and you got so you got the good faith of uh, mm -hmm. 
hey, yeah, technically I don't have to do this, but it shows to them that you care about them as people. And, you know, you did what you felt was right. Mm -hmm. And that buys you a lot down the line when maybe there's a different issue. You could say, yeah, I mean, we help each other out here, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I think that's great. I, I love that you did that. Now, I, I love that, too. And, Adam, the, 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 the upside of your story is that you had $400 that you could put on toward a washer and get it over there. And you took the time and the money and you got the job done. Yeah. Um, what about if it's a bigger issue? What if what if the repair comes up and it's a and it's a costlier issue? And uh, if you're a brand new investor, remember, I said, have some reserves. But wonder if you're a brand new investor and you don't have the reserves. Um, any suggestions, John? On uh, I mean, I, I would I would. Uh, it's not exciting, but no interest credit cards can be your friend. Um, you know, that, that is an option. If you I'm going to talk a, about know, that for a little bit. So yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That would be probably one, one smart, I don't even want to say smart, but an option. Um, you know, usually you'll have at least 12 months to pay those back so you can spread it out. Um, if you don't have reserves, it gets tough, you know, um, financing is, is probably going to be your best bet. Um, and, and some companies will work with you on that as well. Um, but that would probably be the move that I would, that I would think of first. One thing I think everybody should have is a home equity line of credit. Um, yeah. absolutely. Like, even if you never use it, great, but it's there for those oopsies and whoopsies and uh oh moments. Um, and, and Adam's I mean, our funding guy. So yeah, pay attention. Yeah. And I don't. <laughs> I don't sell those, <laughs> but uh, the good folks at First Financial, they have a pretty good product. The good folks at uh, Right Pat Credit Union, they yep. have a really nice product. I had one of them before, which I need to get a new one. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it home equity lines of credit are can be a lifesaver. And people would and be surprised, I think, maybe how much equity you might have in your house after the last few years run up of appreciation. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. A home equity line of credit. It, you don't want to abuse it. It's just like a credit card. You do not mm -hmm. want to abuse it because that's your home. That's the equity in your home. But for an emergency, that is that is a great option. Yes, I like that idea too. And remember, for those of you that are just now getting into to, uh, investing, uh, when you do a line of credit, you don't owe anything on it until you use it. It is like a mm -hmm. credit card. It's The money is just kind of sitting there. It's like your house is the bank. You know, and if you got a ten thousand dollar line of credit, and now your rental property needs a new furnace, or it needs a new hot water tank, or it needs, uh, like John went through, where you've got to dig out the sewer line to the street <laughs> or something to figure out where the, you know, why your sewer isn't draining. I mean, anything that's a sizable type bill, um, then on the line of credit, oftentimes the bank will actually just give you a book of checks just like a checking account and you can just, you know, pay for that repair and then make payments over time back into the line of credit. Now there are uh, residential lines of credit that is toward your home, but you can also have a commercial line of credit if you have a commercial property. And the only thing that I noticed and, and Adam, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking on a commercial line of credit, oftentimes the bank wants you to bring that to zero, like every 24 months or something. They don't like that hanging out there forever yeah so um actually on that note that's a great segue into another product that i love also i don't sell this one i'm just giving stuff away uh <laughs> today but um first financial man they need to sponsor or buy me something but first financial <laughs> they have an awesome uh unsecured business line of credit aha uh -huh. and um that's pretty sweet that's a pretty sweet product it uh, is a low documentation loan. Um, the application's all online. They will go up to $50,000 based on stated income, uh, meaning you tell them what you make and that's, and they say, okay. Uh, so that's what stated income means. Generally speaking, they will give you a line of credit up to around 15% of what your annual revenue is for your business. So in order to get that full 50,000, you would have to, um, 
you would have to have revenue, gross revenue of around 350,000 a year. But uh, even, you know, even if you're only doing 100,000 revenue or whatever, uh, and that's gross revenue. So that's before expenses and everything. Um, but that's a really nice option. Getting lines of credit on commercial buildings tends to be more difficult. Um, they tend to want to play in much higher spaces. So yes, if you had like a, a big commercial building that was worth a couple of million bucks and you wanted a million dollar line of credit on it, that could probably happen. Typically the maximum term on those is no more than five years. And yes, you are right. They might have a covenant in there where they say, hey, you've got to bring it to zero every 24 months or something mm -hmm. like that. So I want to talk a little bit about the credit cards, because I think that's more of the space that we're in with some of the new brand new investors. Um, here's here's how that can work for you. If you go, OK, I get it in theory, but how mechanically does that actually work? Um, if you let's say you have a, a house, uh, you, you have a rental and, and, the, and you need a new roof. And now you're talking, I don't know, let's I'm going to pick ten thousand dollars to make it an even number. So let's say that you need $10,000 and you're thinking, I don't have $10,000. And now this roof is starting to leak. So now it's starting to cause damage to the house. My tenants aren't happy. I already had it rented. So I thought I was home free with passive income, but now I've got to come up with $10,000 and, and I don't have 10,000. What am I going to do? You can go online and you can buy, order, if you will, open, I'll use the word open, open a brand new credit card account and you can put the $10,000 on the credit card. Now, when you do that, you're like, or if you have a credit card already in your pocket, that you have that much of a limit. But now you're saying, oh my gosh, now that's at 26% or something. You know, if you look at the percentage on those credit cards. And so if you don't have convenience checks, which some credit card companies give you after you show your track record, you can put it on a regular credit card that you do not have a convenience check for. It's got 24, 26, 28% interest. And as soon as you charge that, you go online and find a credit card that's trying to get your business and they're offering you 18 months at 0% interest. And so now they'll, it's an automatic approval if online you click in that your let's say your account in your pocket is i'm just going to use this as an example let's just say the credit card in your pocket is a chase you will go ahead and swipe the card you bought the ten thousand dollar roof the charge is now going to hit your credit card but you haven't the first billing period hasn't happened yet you can go online to a credit card that's offering zero percent for 18 months and you can it'll say what credit balance are you transferring over it's a transfer balance offer to help get your business and you can say i'm going to transfer this ten thousand that's hit my chase even though i haven't paid anything yet i want to transfer it to a zero percent credit card offer now oftentimes on those zero percent they're going to charge three or five percent as a fee to do the transfer but how many here can agree with me that paying three or 5% for $10,000 is probably one of the best deals you're going to get? I mean, even if you get a line of credit, it might not be three or 5%. It might be closer to 7%. And, Am I right, Adam? Yeah. And, and, if, and if you uh, are looking for something like that, keep an eye on Bank of America um, because every once in a while not often and it's like at different times of the year and you got to have good credit but i have i have seen balance transfer fees at one percent with bank of america and there was a chase one now this is a couple years ago so i don't know if they do it anymore but they did a balance transfer for me one time at zero percent zero percent and zero dollar ba balance transfer fee i was like that is literally free money how yes. would i not do that and they're and and it's like, well, why would they do that? And they're banking on that the fact that once it actually starts accruing interest, a certain percentage of people are just are going to forget about it, or they're going mm -hmm. to start paying interest then, or whatever. Now that was in a lower interest rate environment. I don't know if we're going to see that anymore, but uh, yeah, it's worth shopping for that. Um, yeah, especially if you can get three percent. Three percent, I think, is like the sweet spot. Yes. And and I'm here to tell you that that the deals are out there. If you just Google it uh, later today and just say, what are the you know top 
credit cards that are giving away transfer uh, balance offers, they'll a whole list will come right up and you can scroll down through and pick the one that best fits your situation. And now here's here's what I want to end with this is as soon as as you do that, as soon as you decide you're going to swipe a card and then transfer the balance to get that deal, make sure that you set up a payment plan in your bill pay to automatically pay that monthly fee. And if it's 18 months, I divide it into 17 payments. If Get a calculator 12, out. Do it right yep, away. If it's, if it's 12 months, I divide it into 11 payments because I always want to make sure that I pay it off before that offer expires. And sometimes, depending on how long it takes your payment to hit the account, if you're late at any time, guess what? And here's 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 the downside. Guess what happens? The bank puts that whole 24%, 26, 28, whatever their percentage is, they sock it to that whole balance. And that's what you don't want to have happen. So make sure if you're going to do this, that you are very prompt on making those monthly payments. And again, I cut it a month short to make sure that the whole balance is paid off before that 12 or 18 or 24, whatever the offer was before the offer expires. So I want to go back to John. Um, John, is is all of that a good idea? Yeah. Is that a way that you can get around some of those? I, big I mean, I think that there's a lot of value in, in banking on yourself and betting on yourself. I think that business is risk. And I mean, I'm a risk taker when it comes to business. I've been successful with that. But you have to be strategic. You have to be smart. And you don't want to play too fast and loose because it can end up really biting you. I've seen it happen to other people. Um, so yes, I think it can be a good idea, uh, with the caveat that you are making sure that you are taking care of yourself, taking care of your finances and, and not overdoing it. And, and the win-win on this one is, is if you do it correctly and you are on top of it and, and you pay, pay it off before it's, it's the, the offer expires, guess what it does to your credit score? Yeah. So then it makes your credit score even better. And then you start getting these convenience checks where you don't have to do that swipe the card and then do the transfer. You can just write the convenience check and get 18 months at 0%. And now you don't have a transfer fee. And another tip on keeping your credit score up is never cancel a credit card. I mean, if it has an annual fee, then maybe. But like for most, most of the time, you don't want to cancel your credit card because generally speaking, 30 to 40% of your credit uh, score is based on utilization. And so that's the amount of credit that you have, the, the outstanding balances that you have versus the overall credit limits that you have across all cards. And on any given card, you should try and avoid going over 35% of the credit limit if you can on a monthly basis. Yeah. And so again, one of my strategies is I have a pocket full of credit cards. And uh, and again, you have to you have to really have self-control. Don't overdo it. But I don't use any one card over that 35 percent. And uh, and then I can transfer back and forth between them to get those zero percent offers. And I haven't paid interest in 10 years. So it's a plan. But it can it can bite you if you if you're not careful. John, how can folks get in touch with you? And uh, and and I know Adam has to jump off here. He had a hard pass at one o'clock. So Adam, thank you. Uh, real quick, tell folks I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Adam real quick. Tell folks how they can get in touch with you, Adam, if they need some funding. Sure. Um, yeah, you can call me at 614-595-3457 or Adam at lfglending.com. And I am putting all my contact information in the chat, um, along with my Calendly link, which is uh, my calendar. So if you want to schedule a call out uh, and have me give you a call, we can talk about your uh, financing needs. I'd be happy to help. But thanks, guys. Yeah. Appreciate you. Good to see yes. you again, John. Good yes. to see you, Kyle. Good to see, Good you, to see you, everybody. Thanks, all Kathy. Right. Appreciate you. See you, Adam. Adam has to jump off. Um, we're going to jump over to Kyle. Kyle, give us information on the finding, how we can get in touch with you. And then we're going to end up with John. Yeah, everybody, I'll put my information in the chat too, um, but you probably see my pay, my face around on Kathy's website and Facebook pages, um, but my number is 614-769-7057, or you can visit me at iamkylebrandon.com. 
Very good. Very good. So thank you for that. And Kyle is also one of my co-host co-mods and he's our, our in-house finder to find our properties. Uh, he's working with several of us that are on this call today, finding properties for us. And John, last but not least, tell us how folks can get in touch with you if they have any questions about what it is that you're doing, about your management company, and also... Um, you know, I know Carmela's looking for a management company. Her property is out of state. Um, but if she has some questions, she can get in touch with you as well. Perfect. Yeah, I put uh, in my uh, my contact information in the chat. Um, you know, I got my email, john at the group.com, My phone number, 614-843-5656. And then uh, the management company's uh, website, styrehospitalityco.com, as well as my brokerage website, which is styrerep dot com. So yeah, I, any any of those methods. I love it. John, thank you so much for being on with us today. For everybody that's still on the call, you can reach me at kathybinner.com and I put that in the chat as well. And if you go to my homepage of my website, there's all kinds of ways to connect with me. You can uh, book a, a call to chat. Um, you can look at all of our free replays. We record all of Everybody that we interview or, or whatever topic we're talking about, we record it and the replays are all uploaded into the Academy and just scroll across the menu bar at the top of the website and find the topic. And so today we're under uh, real estate investors. And so just find the topic. And then when you open up that topic, you'll see all the different replay options there. So just click through. Now, I my platform is on Teachable, so it may ask you to create an, a Teachable account but it is free. So you can just, um, you know, open up that teachable account. It's just going to ask for an email and, and maybe a password if you want to have one. And then that way you can scroll around in the Academy and you can listen to any of the free stuff all over the place. So we'd love to have you there. Um, we're on every month, the third Monday of every month, we talk about real estate. Um, you do not need to register again, the registration link that you use to get here is the same registration link. And so you can just tap in every month, the third Monday at 12 noon. And also the third week of every month in the Columbus, Ohio area is a big real estate month. We have the big coin meetup. We have the profit with real estate in Lancaster meetup. Uh, Corey has a, an event almost every single night on a Zoom call. So there's tons of stuff going on in the real estate community. And if you are interested in being an investor, and building some passive income and creating some wealth for yourself and a legacy for your family, uh, plug into as many of those networking events as you can and build your team with folks just like us. And if you have any questions, this is one of the only, and John and Kyle, you can help me with this. Am I right? This is one of the only industries, especially in the Columbus, Ohio area, where everyone wants to help you. Everyone is so helpful. It doesn't matter where you go. Everybody's like, let me help you find that. Let me help you look for that. Let me help you fix that. And so it's so it's such a helpful community. And uh, and I think you'll find that in other areas as well. Um, I just recently joined uh, some real estate meetups in Florida where we have a condo. And, uh, and, and it's all about bringing value and helping you do better in your investing journey. So uh, please tap in. And yes, the abundance mindset, John says, absolutely. And so I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, save the chat. I, I will put all of that connect information in the replay as well. So if the only thing you remember today is kathybenner.com and you see my name here in my little Hollywood square, you can get to everybody's contact information in the replay. So um, save my name, kathybenner.com, uh, scroll over there and listen to all of our replays. And we'll see everybody next month. John, thank you. Kyle, thank you. Thank very you. Much. And thank you everyone for being on today and we'll see you again. Bye everyone.